What happened to Predator, heroes? After the movies, Dutch, Harrigan, Royce, and Quinn McKenna. If we do not consider the Alien vs. Predator crossovers, the Predator franchise is spread across four movies, innumerable comics, and other literature. While Arnold Schwarzenegger and Dutch Schaefer fought the jungle hunter in the Guatemalan jungles with brains and bronze, Danny Glover as Lieutenant Mike Harrigan slew the city hunter with his own apex weapons. In the movie Predators, Adrian Brody as Royce battled and emerged victorious against the super predators. Probably a unique protagonist has to be Quinn McKenna from the 2018 film The Predator, who dons a device named the Predator Killer to become a human predator. However, what happened to these great heroes is shrouded in mystery and darkness. In this video, we will cover the massive unexplained mysteries related to the protagonists of the franchise and get some definitive answers about the future beyond the films. For the purposes of the video, we have explored several comics, cancelled movie content, and other sources of literature and have brought them to you in a comprehensive format. So, our dear loyal hunters, Sit tight and enjoy as we dive deep into the lives of Dutch, Harrigan, and Royce. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Predator 1 what happened to Dutch Schaefer after the movie? We all know that Alan Schaefer, or Dutch, was the leader of a group of mercenaries and ex-military men who only partook in rescue missions and never killed anyone who didn't stand in their way. Hence, they maintained a strong moral code, much like the Predators themselves. He and his team were hired by the US Army and the CIA to participate in the rescue mission of some high officials who had been abducted by rebel guerrillas and kept hostage in the dense jungles of Guatemala. However, when Dutch learned that the entire mission had been a plot by the CIA to take out rebels, he got ferocious as he felt cheated and his men used. Green Berets out of Fort Bragg. Now what the hell were they doing here? I don't know, Dutch. This is an... Dutch tried his best to take down the jungle hunter predator, but unfortunately, he failed. He later used his military and combat knowledge and tactfully took down the predator, but got exposed to whatever radiations came out of the dying predator's self-destruct device. He was ultimately rescued from the Guatemalan jungles and taken to a hospital, where he started to experience adverse health conditions that were similar to radiation sickness. At the hospital, he was visited and interviewed by Peter Keyes of the Otherworldly Life Form Program, or OWLF. Keyes wanted to know the sequence of events that took place in the jungle. Dutch eventually escaped from the hospital and went underground for several years. Sometime later, John Schaefer, the elder brother of Dutch, would also encounter predators while he was looking for his sibling. It was later revealed through different sources that Dutch's story and quests against the jungle hunter predator had become a legend, even in the Yacha circles. The Yachas had received records of the events via the jungle hunter ship. Many of them started to feel deep respect and admiration towards Dutch. The most notable of these was the city hunter predator that we saw in Predator 2. Dutch's ordeal had gained humanity the respect of the Yachas. After running away from the hospital, Dutch began his arduous journey towards the jungles in the hopes of learning more about the Predator. He also started to keep a record of his experiences, and through these records, we learn about his whereabouts post the incidents of the first film. Dutch assumed the identity of an author who was researching the stories about a demon who made trophies out of men. While most of the stories he heard from the locals turned out to be sheer rumors and fables, the others were consistent with what he had experienced. He deduced that the Predators had been coming to Earth for a long time now. In 1992, Dutch once again met Keyes as an old friend, and the two of them shared Predator stories over drinks. While Keyes was obsessed with retrieving the Yachua tech to weaponize it, 
Dutch was worried about the mere existence of such beastly creatures amongst humanity. By 1996, he set up another private firm that performed search and rescue ops. He dubbed his men the Haunted Soldiers because unbeknownst to them, they were being used as prey or bait in Dutch's quest to find the Predator. His patience paid off when he took the job of rescuing a group of men from an outpost in Congo. Upon reaching there, he found several mutilated and skinned corpses. When the Predator revealed himself to Dutch's men, they opened fire, but a bullet struck a crate of RPG rounds and exploded, creating a chain of explosions. The men and the beast died, but Dutch survived, only to salvage the Yachua technology and let the world believe that he was among the deceased. In 1997, when Dutch heard that the city of Los Angeles was plagued with the twin problems of a gang war and heat wave, he made his way to LA, hoping to come face to face with the Predator, but was unfortunately too late, as Mike Harrigan had already taken it down. He was later captured by the OWLF agents and had to trade his Yachua tech in return for freedom. He then brokered a deal with his captors, and they joined hands to fight the Predators. Dutch and the OWLF worked together until 2018, when the organization was disbanded in favor of Project Stargazer. He was present in Mexico when Stargazer captured the fugitive predator, but he knew that it was a stupid move to capture a predator alive. After this point, things go a little futuristic in the year 2025, when OWLF was reinstated. Due to his old age of 78 years, and a near-fatal incident with a predator, he was forced to have his DNA spliced with that of a predator. The experimental procedure turned out to be successful, and he started to work with the son of the late Peter Keyes, Sean Keyes. Schaefer's character was supposed to appear in the film Predators, where he would have been the leader of the predators in the Game Preserve planet. However, this idea never saw the light of day. Predator 2 What happened to Mike Harrigan after the film? In 1997, the city of Los Angeles was suffering from a sweltering heat wave and a heated street war between the Jamaican and Colombian drug gangs. Lieutenant Michael R. Harrigan entered the scene of the crime to rescue two wounded officers. Harrigan did a great job forcing the Colombian gangsters to withdraw into a nearby building, but the building soon got rocked by several explosions. Harrigan that notices the silhouette of a predator. Peter Keyes was leading a federal task force that was in charge of investigating the cartels of Los Angeles. Harrigan and his team found one of the predator's weapons that was stuck in an air conditioner. He and Danny decided to investigate the weapon that they found and arranged for a meeting later at the apartment. However, the predator killed Danny as he arrived as the film progressed, Harrigan gets caught by Keyes and his men, but he escapes their custody and fights the Predator in his spaceship. In the ensuing battle, Harrigan was clearly not a match for the hulking monster, but he still managed to kill it. Several other Yachua approached Harrigan. They instead only took away their fallen warrior and the elder predator presented Harrigan with a revolver as a reward for his courage and bravery. After the events of the film, Harrigan's story was left rather untouched for several years. However, the Titan Books anthology, Predator, If It Bleeds, had a short story titled Drug Wars. Brian Thomas Schmidt and Holly Roberts wrote this 2017 story, and it reunited Harrigan with former OWLF agent Garber. After 40 years of service and taking down a predator, Mike Harrigan retired from the Los Angeles PD. After retirement, he became an advisor for urban police departments all around the globe and taught cops ways to tackle extreme gang violence and wars. Harrigan was attending a conference in Brazil's Rio de Janeiro, where he chanced upon one of his old adversaries, Garber, from OWLF. It turned out that Garber had quit OWLF and now sold high-end weaponry and other related equipment in the global market. 
Two Rio cops named Ana Rios and Rodrigo Vilaca met Garber at his stall and questioned him about the weapons that he was selling, as there was a question about their legality in Rio. However, all eyes turned toward the noise from a distant explosion. Harrigan, being Harrigan, rushed towards Ana and Rodrigo to investigate this event, but they discover several other blasts in the favelas. Garber joined Harrigan, Ana, and Rodrigo to look into the cause of the blasts. Through his sniper rifle, he spotted a skinned corpse hanging from a tree, and this sight was enough for Harrigan to realize that a predator was active in the sprawling favelas that covered the neighboring hills. Harrigan, Ana, and Rodrigo headed to the favelas, and Garber began to arm himself with the high-tech weapons that he had come to sell. Once inside the slums, there seemed nothing less than a maze. Harrigan lost contact with Ana and Rodrigo. Fortunately, he bumped into a local named Fernando, who was sort of obsessed with Los Angeles and always wanted to move there. Upon hearing that Harrigan was from this dream city, Fernando offered to show him around, and Harrigan agreed. Harrigan and Fernando soon discovered the bloody mess that the Predator had created, and Harrigan deduced that the Predator had come to Rio after being attracted by the heavily armed drug wars that plagued the favelas, and its prime intent was to take down the gangsters who participated in such wars. He couldn't help but relate these events to the ones from Los Angeles when he found himself at the center of one such fight. Harrigan and Fernando then witnessed the Predator slay a bunch of mobsters with his plasma caster. But Garber reappeared to engage the fiercest hunter of the galaxy in a high-octane fight with his advanced weapons. Harrigan realized that he was criminally under-equipped, so he raided a gang hideout to get a hold of a few weapons. After equipping himself, he set off in pursuit of the Predator. Harrigan quickly got a vantage point to take down the Predator from where he witnessed the hulking beast slaying Garber. When Fernando tried to engage the Predator in an amateur fashion, Harrigan shot the Predator at his shoulder, wounding him and saving Fernando. The two men then tracked the Predator's luminous blood. Harrigan and a squad of heavily armed policemen trapped the Yachua, but four other Predators arrived to confront it. These Predators had come to the favela to apprehend the one wreaking havoc because the latter was to be brought to Yachua justice for a crime he had committed. They restrain the rogue and take him away. While the story was limited and didn't hold much depth, it did manage to give some level of closure to Harrigan's character. Run! Predators. What happened to Royce? Royce's life before and after the events of the film is fascinating yet dark. Royce used to be a US Special Ops veteran who later turned into a mercenary and appeared in the film Predators. At some point in time, as a mercenary, Royce blew up a building that had a grade school in the basement. The faulty intelligence he had received led to the deaths of many innocent children and women. The incident took a severe toll on Royce's life, and he became a cold, morose man with a no-nonsense attitude, his mind and soul scarred. Following this, people in his line of work started to believe that he had no conscience, and he started getting better offers for his job. Later, he was contacted by an African general to eliminate a rebel, and Royce happily accepted the offer. The bodies he slew during this task were innumerous, and because he took down an entire rebel army comprised of mercenaries like himself, Royce accomplished something impossible that day. The Predator Tracker closely monitored this sequence of events, and ultimately abducted him and dropped him in the game Preserve Planet with a strange parachute. This relates the comics to the 2010 film Predators, Joyce woke up from his unconsciousness in this parachute and landed roughly but safely on the ground and met several equally deadly people with different backgrounds. He reluctantly became the leader of a group of humans on an alien planet. At the end of the film, we learn that Royce and Isabel were the only survivors of the bloody massacre that took place on the Game Preserve planet. Furthermore, as they lay exhausted from the terrific battle with the predators of the movie, they saw that more prey were being dropped on the planet. Royce fought these prey for about two months, and during this period he followed the simple code of hunt or be hunted. He was already a master assassin, but his time at the Game Preserve planet and his quest to survive turned him into an expert hunter. 
Naturally, his progress as a skilled hunter caught the eyes and respect of the predators, and he was presented with Yachua equipment, specifically crafted for him. It included body armor, wrist blades, wrist computer gauntlet, shoulder cannon, and a bio helmet which was programmed in English. But why was he provided with such weapons and armor? Well, it was meant to prepare him to fight an ultimate foe in the form of the four-armed predator. Tasked with killing the two of them, Forearm proved that he was not just a hulking monster, but was adept in using technology and his brain whenever needed. This behemoth's body armor seemed to be more resilient than other armors we have come across, with the obvious exception of the mutilated predator and the upgrade predator. But before Royce could understand much about the use of his new toys, the four-armed predator attacked him and Isabel, and a fierce battle ensued. But Royce and Isabel were no match for the ferocity and strength of the four-armed predator, and they concluded that it was best to fight another day and tried to escape. But the predator gave them a chase. Once out of its sight, Royce realized that his new helmet was designed to pick up brainwaves, a feature that allowed him to interact with his gear. Royce managed to finally kill the four-armed predator with the help of Isabel, but as he looked up in the sky, he saw more predators landing through parachutes. While Royce's story doesn't give us any closure, it does manage to tell us that his future wasn't so dark after all. Royce believed that one day the predators would allow him to leave the Game Preserve planet and send him home. Perhaps he is right. Or is he? Predator 2018 What happened to Quinn McKenna after the movie? That's my new suit, Bubba. I hope they got in the 42 long. Quinn McKenna was an ex-United States Army Ranger who saved the day in the 2018 film The Predator. While he was on a mission in Mexico, he encountered the fugitive Predator and got captured by the personnel of Project Stargazer. Last one. He sent parts of Yachua technology to his home, where his son Rory found them. Because of this, he became the obvious target of the Upgrade Predator, whose objectives were destroying any traces of Predator technology and killing the fugitive. Now, it was previously believed that the fugitive Predator came to Earth to kill humans, but his real intentions were to provide the humans with an elite piece of technology called the Predator Killer. At the end of this not-so-worthy film, Quinn proclaims that the Predator Killer is going to be his next suit. The Predator Killer was a device that resembled a Predator once a human put it on. Although a helpless scientist was the first one to wear the armor, it was ensured in the film that McKenna would be the one to don it later. While there are no new stories that tell the tale of this very cool army ranger, it is certain that we get more closure with McKenna than we got in the case of Royce. Do you think these stories are worth being turned into movies? Or, do you feel that there should be more profound and broader content before such a step is taken? Tell us your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to check out our other videos describing the nature, biology, social structure, and other interesting secrets about predators and aliens. We'll see you on the next hunt. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone. Oh shit!